This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Are you ready? <laughs> the picture behind me is, uh, is wait, I got it. It's, uh, it's uh, Lu Xun. Lu, Lu Shan. Lu Xun. Lu Xun. Yes. Okay, and we talked about him before. And we, right. meaning I wanted to find everything this time. Yes. <laughs> uh, professor jo uh, uh, John Davidan, a uh, history professor at HPU. Right. And he's the author of a book he'd been working on for some time, yes. which is The Limits of Western. Westernization, That's right. which is on the table. You can see it, right. okay? And this is very important, and, and, and I guess a core mm, uh, part of this whole investigation is what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Now, we talked yeah. about World War I. Right. We talked about, you know, what I, what I would recall as a sort of vacuum after World War I. Yeah. And we had all these people trying to figure out where do we go now, what do we do, how do we fill the vacuum globally. Right. Right. Um, this is a, you know, it's sort of a, a really interesting time in the 30s, right. yeah. um, an intellectual moment, if you will. And I have this vision of these guys sitting around in coffee shops, uh, sipping coffee yeah. with spectacles, um, actually, talking about intellectual. Actually, no. In, no? in, in the period, <laughs> especially in East Asia, in yeah. the period of the 1930s, especially the late 1930s, to be an intellectual in either Japan or China is a pretty dangerous business. Yeah. Government didn't like it. No, neither. No, no. You know, not the Japanese government, not the Chinese government. So many of them were thrown in jail. Some of them were killed. They were uh, beaten up. Why was it at the wrong end? I mean, what was wrong with it? Why was it so threatening? Well, I mean, they said the wrong things. They criticized governments. That's probably the biggest thing. Is uh, we talked. Uh, so last time we talked about Hu Xi, uh, this major intellectual who became the amb the Chinese ambassador to the United States in the 1940s. Very World westernized War. type of guy. Well, he was, but he was, so he was an intense critic of the Guomindang, uh, the Chinese government, the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek. And so they didn't like, they never threw him in jail. He was too powerful to throw in jail. But they hated the criticism, and he was just harping on them constantly because the, the Guomindang was corrupt and, you know, it was all kinds of problems with their rule. So, uh, but so up to this point, in the 19 teens and 20s, then what you have is East Asian intellectuals constructing a modernity which is, looks actually a bit different from Western modernity. It, the sources are different. They're looking at Confucianism. Remember Wang Yang Ming, the old guy, in, in, in yeah, one of our previous. All of these names are yeah, so right. interesting. But you know what I get is that after the turn of the 20th century, right. after the war, and the vacuum of the war and the tumult in China and the yeah. spheres of inf influence that had yeah. such a threatening effect on yeah. China from the West. Um, he, people there and here and in, in Europe were looking for a better world. It right. was Wilsonian, right. you know, That's and right. it's That's looking right. over for a better so, world. So you, and these guys were bent on that. Yeah, so, well, you have, so you have these different views, but you also have some agreement about basic principles of modernity progress, scientific rationality, and human liberation. Ah, we can only have so, them today. Right, so, <laughs> you're right, they're nice ideas, they're good ideas. And Wilsonianism is, of course, a part of that. But what happens in the 1930s, so you've got that platform, you've got these differences, but you also have the similarities of these intellectuals. Both East and West, they agree upon these three ideas. Were they in touch? Oh yeah, oh yeah, so, so they agree upon them in the 1930s, their faith in basically these, what I would call the articles of modernity, those three ideas, you know, progress, human liberation, scientific rationality, right? They begin to lose faith in those ideas or they reconfigure them in such a way that they don't, they don't even resemble the kinds of uh, notions that we were thinking why? about earlier. What were the things that made right, them give right, it up? Why, right, right. why did they move on well, from so, obviously good principles? Yeah, so, so a uh, lot of reasons. It's complex. History is complex. You've heard that before. <laughs> so in order to understand that, we have to go to Charles Beard. And if we can bring up a picture of Charles Beard, Beard is maybe the most famous intellectual in the history of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, he's, he, he represents all of the, the three ideas. He's a progressive. He believes that science uh, can solve the problems of humanity. Okay, he's a political scientist, and, uh, and he's a historian. And he, he's the only person in the history of, really, well, the history of the United States, 
who serves as the president of both the American Historical Association and the president of the American Political Science Association. That's how important he is. He's this uh, huge figure. And so this would be in the 30s. This is this is his his scholarship starts really in 1913. Oh. He publishes his first major book. He's a professor at Columbia University. Okay. He publishes his first major book, a critique of the constitution making of the country, saying that it's oh the it, the constitution was a compromise made on uh, among economic elites. It wasn't this idealistic document that, you know. So so he's a He's a major critic and he's a skeptic from the beginning, but he also believes in these three things. He believes in progress, scientific rationality, and human liberation, right? So, so he's, he's working, he's, he's involved in reform efforts, and he's trying to make this happen in his world, right? To, to make the reforms that will, will, that will solve the problems, that will bring on modernity, right? So he goes to Japan in 1922. He's, by this time, he's resigned from Columbia University. He resigns in World War I. In pro this is really amazing. He resigns in protest because some of his colleagues have been uh, criticized and have been released or fired from Columbia University because they refuse to sign loyalty pledges concerning World War I. I got to say that I so admire a guy who would do that. They, I mean, you don't have that so much. His anybody. job was not threatened. Yeah. I mean, it was so selfless and courageous yes, of Charles Beard. Yes, to, yes, yes, so, yes, yes. So, so by this time, Beard is actually he's working for uh, the New York Bureau of uh, Municipal Research, uh, which is an organization that studies cities and, and tries to reform cities to make them more modern. Beard is invited to Tokyo to study Tokyo and recommend reforms that would modernize Tokyo. This is watershed right there. That I can... Well, I can tell you what you're going to tell me. <laughs> okay, okay. So he gets to Tokyo, and what he realizes after his trip is that Tokyo is actually a very modern city already. Was that the answer? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. See, yes. that was the answer. So, so what happens is Tokyo actually modernizes over a very long time period. Uh, their transportation systems, uh, their sewage systems, their water systems, they're actually built in way back in the 16 and 1700s. So they've got, they're actually a, a more modern city than many Western <laughs> so cities interesting. in that time period. But nonetheless, you know, uh, Beard goes there and he gives lots of lectures and everything and he, he makes a few recommendations which they mostly ignore. What were the recommendations that he might have given to them right. which they didn't know about and which they ignored? Right, so, so one of the things is in Japan generally and in the Tokyo uh, politics, the, the political system was weighted toward elites. Uh, the way the mayor was chosen, uh, the way council people were elected, there were a lot of people who weren't allowed to vote. Women were not allowed to vote. Uh, and so Beard said, hey, you've got to get women involved in, in municipal governance. That was one of his recommendations. That, that, yeah, that's, that's a pretty feisty which, recommendation. Which Japan. they ignored. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Beard goes home. And then in 1923, the Kanto earthquake takes place. And it destroys much of Tokyo. And so uh, uh, they, the, the, uh, the mayor and the council invite Beard back to help in the, re the reconstruction of Tokyo because, of course, the destruction of the city is a major opportunity to build it in sure. a way that, you know, sure. is more modern. Sure. Well, <clears throat> so Beard makes a few recommendations the second time he's there, but honestly, he doesn't have much of an impact. This is the limits of westernization. Right. Americans, back, back in the U.S., there's a New York Times article that talks about how Charles Beard will rebuild Tokyo after the Kanto earthquake. Americans think that he's going to lead this rebuilding effort. Beard actually has to put an editorial in the New York Times saying, no, no, actually, none of that's true. <laughs> I'm here When's to the help. the last time you saw that? <laughs> yeah. and, but Beard says, you know, the Japanese have very good engineers. They know what to do. And so, so there's this, there's in a nutshell, part of the problem is the Americans assume that they're going to be front and center in shaping East Asian modernity in Tokyo in this yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Beard says, no, no, no. Okay, so he knew a lot more about Japan than they did. He did, yeah, yeah. And so, so Beard is, uh, 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 so, so, but he's still this proponent of reform and progress and scientific rationality. 
But Charles Beard goes through an evolution which, be, which really causes his own uh, intellectual crisis in the late 1920s. Really? One of the problems, you, you mentioned Wilsonianism. Beard was a big proponent of Wilsonianism before World War II. But after the war, Beard realized that Wilson's call to democratize the world was taken by the European powers as a call to grab more land, as a call to, to take more... I think he was right. Uh, ...more colonies. Well, so what happens in, uh, in the Middle East is the Ottoman Empire falls apart, and the Europeans sign a secret treaty called the Sykes-Picot Treaty, 1916, right in the midst of the war. Well, no one knows about this. But after the war, it divides up the Middle East into French and British spheres. It's so he wasn't kidding. It's, it's imperialism, it's, yeah. This was, this was right. real. This was true, so what he said. the only way that, that everyone knows about this treaty is, this is complicated, but it's interesting. The Bolsheviks win the revolution in Russia. The Bolsheviks have decided that these Western imperialist powers need to be outed. So the Bolsheviks released these secret documents that the Russian government was in on, including the Sykes-Picot oh, Treaty. Okay. So Beard is outraged. He said, oh, this is not Wilsonianism. This is, Europe. this is just more European imperialism. And I aided and abetted it by supporting American involvement in World so War I. So he reverses I. himself. So he, begin, he begins to be skeptical. Now, his skepticism on international relations is accompanied, of course, in the early 1930s you have the Japanese becoming very aggressive in East Asia. He had been a big proponent of Japan, uh, but with Japan's takeover of, Man of Manchuria in 1931. That could turn you off. That's right, he got turned off at that. He, he uh, uh, began to denounce Japan. Then, of course, in the United States, there's the economic crisis, ah, the, the Great Depression. What a great time yes. to have a break. Okay. Okay, so we can just, just sort of dwell on that language okay. and then fill up the, the chasm of history okay, in the 30s. Yes. That's John David Ann, history professor at HPU. We'll be right back after the short break. I can hardly wait. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can be the world, you can be the war. Talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Stay in the hall of fame. Uh, uh, in the world's gonna know your name. Hello everyone, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Hello Hawaii. の日本語放送のコスト国末ゆかりです各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組ですこんにちはハワイ各週の月曜日2時からぜひ皆さん見てくださいコストの国末ゆかりでしたアロハジョン・デイビッド・アン・ヒストリー・レンズ Right. The crisis of modernity, right. East and West, the 1930s. Right. And what you're describing, John, you know, you can still see elements of these things today. Yes. Is that a very formative process no, in this right. period of time that you can still see? Absolutely. Anyway, we yeah. left it with a cliffhanger. Right, so, so the Great Depression crashes the American economy. And it also, so uh, Beard was this guy who believed that science, and, in, and for him, political science, would deliver uh, a, a pro an economy that grew and grew. Historical progress, the line going up all the time. Well, the Great Depression, the line started going down. But if you were there, or if I were there, yeah. 1930, before the Depression actually began, right. you'd feel the same way, wouldn't Yes, you? and of course today we still feel the same way, right? <laughs> There's not going to be a recession, but the economy's going to keep going Science up. Science will carry us through. Right, right, so Beard becomes a skeptic of progress, of science, and he has his own ideas about human liberation. Beard, Charles Beard becomes, uh, so, so he critiques science. He gives a talk at the American Historical Association when he's the president of, 
uh, called History as an Act of Let's Faith. Let's show that picture of, of Beard right now. Yeah, if now, we, so if we, we can see what he, we can look deeply there, in his eyes. There, there it is. There's, yes, the so there's Charles right, Beard. Okay. And you can see he's got a collar like a preacher. <laughs> Charles Beard, he's a professor of history, but he really yeah, yeah. is in many ways like... A great the, statement about Columbia. No? Yeah, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> well, Columbia had its own problems. It had its own problems in the morning paper today. Oh, okay. But anyway, go right. ahead. So, so, um, so Beard becomes the skeptic. He also begins to believe that the international system is very dangerous, and he becomes an isolationist. He argues that the only trade the United States should have is essential articles. Everything else should be done on barter, and the Americans should not be interacting with the outside world. The budget of the military should be cut to the bone. We only have 14,000 troops in the, the Army well, at that really point. Peanuts. Compared Beard. to the millions who were in uniform during World War I. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So, so, and Beard thinks he has the ear of Roosevelt in the early 1930s. A big supporter of Roosevelt in the first election. Roosevelt disappoints him, bigger government, bigger military, especially the Navy, which Roosevelt builds out in the 1930s. And so Beard becomes a fierce critic of Roosevelt and, and maintains this position that isolation of what Beard calls American continentalism. That, that sounds like isolationism it, to me. It is, but basically the argument Beard has is that we can get everything we need in North America. Mm, nationalism. <laughs> yes, good nationalism, but also a, an idea that the Americas, North, North and South America, should be self-reliant and shouldn't stay away from this very dangerous international system. Was he known? Was he famous? Did he have traction oh, yeah. in the oh, yeah. American community? His books were the best-selling books of his generation. Uh, he, was, he was the dean of American historians. So, yeah, he was, he was the best-known historian ah, of his generation. Ah, okay. So, yeah, he had a lot of traction, actually. So, so Beard becomes terribly dis disillusioned, and at the outbreak of World War II, he accuses the Roosevelt administration of having known about the Pearl Harbor attack beforehand. He's the one who starts this conspiracy theory about Pearl Harbor, which is alive today. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of people repeat that. Right, yeah. so, so th there's no truth in it, but... Uh, Beard uh, believed that Rose, the Roosevelt administration knew and just kept it from the American people because they wanted war, wanted against, war. Yeah. against Japan. So that's Charles Beard. And he, honestly, this last act, last act of Charles Beard, the conspiracy theory, really destroys his career. I mean, he's, he's quite old at this point. He dies in 1948. But, oh, gee, that's uh, a long career he, from he, 1913, you said? 1948. He whoa. does, and he writes throughout that career. So he's really a remarkable intellectual. But well, why so, do you say it destroyed his career? Well, because other historians say the oh, guy is crazy. Oh, the guy has okay, lost right. his mind. Okay. Uh, so yeah, he's really discredited. Be the other problem is there's no, we don't have any evidence that that's true. So this is a big problem for Beard. Well, it's a big problem for any uh, academic, isn't it? You it can't is. make a statement like that. You can't come to a conspiracy theory like that it is. without any evidence. But Beard, of course, he didn't have a job at an academic institution, so he didn't have that risk. He was independently wealthy. He had this farming operation in Connecticut that had made him wealthy, and his books made him wealthy, so he didn't have anything to lose by, you know, by taking a flyer. <laughs> except his reputation, unfortunately. And I, didn't, I think he really didn't understand that. So, yeah. But Beard, this fierce guy, very stubborn guy, high collar, like a preacher, unwilling to compromise. Now, when we think about Beard's kind of his crisis in terms of modernity, well, that also happens in East Asia. It's a different kind of uh, crisis in East Asia, but so what happens in East Asia is, especially with the relationship between China and Japan, Japan is increasingly aggressive with China. China is increasingly falling apart in this time period. There are concerns about uh, Western imperialists taking even more control in China, maybe once again threatening Japan. So in this atmosphere, you have two important intellectuals. Uh, you have uh, Yoshino Sakuzo, and we, we showed the picture, but we can bring that picture up again. Yoshino Sakuzo, uh, is a, uh, he's an intellectual in, uh, uh, he's, there he is, dapper in his suit and tie. He is the foremost democracy advocate of Japan before World War II. Yoshino is a professor at Tokyo Imperial University. He leads protests in the late 19-teens and the 1920s. 
And he was not thrown in jail? No, not in that time period. That's that, there was a certain swell of uh, support for that idea. Because there was a lot of millions of people uh, joined in his protest. And, and was so. that you know, really for democracy? I, mean, I have a definitional problem when right. you use that term. Right. Uh, or, or was that just to be Western? <laughs> no, this is actually the key to Yoshino's thought because Yoshino looked at Western style democracies and, democracies and said, you know what, this will not work in Japan. Uh, and so his idea of democracy is what's called minpon shugi, which is the people's sovereignty, which, which is kind of a, not a completely accurate transla translation. But so what Yoshino said is, you know what, Western system, the sovereignty is located in the people. But in Japan, we have an emperor, so we can't locate sovereignty in the people. Mm. The emperor is still sovereign. But the emperor, in, in Minpon Shugi, the emperor should, by virtue of his position as emperor. You should listen to the should people. care for yeah. the people. Yeah. And yeah. then what you can do on the bottom, the people themselves, you can push for all kinds of demo the same kinds of democratic reforms that are taking place in the West, but with the understanding that this is a kind of functional democracy, it's not sovereign democracy. Uh, so, so that's a key well, insight. Similar thinking in Europe, you know, that if you had the power and had the money, you had an obligation yeah. to take care of the right, people. Right, right, right. But Yoshino is very serious about the democracy part of this. Now, Yoshino, uh, he's a very popular guy, he's a very important guy. Uh, Taisho Demo the Taisho democracy movement is really, he's the head of it. But he makes this terrible mistake. Uh -oh. uh, he knows that he has enemies, and, and he knows that he would like to speak out even more freely and have more, uh, more power. Uh, and he's not paid very much at Tokyo Imperial, so he quits his job at Tokyo Imperial University, takes a job at uh, one of the major Tokyo newspapers, begins to write these scathing editorials. Against the government. Against the government, very critical of the government. He had been all along been critical of the government, especially the government's uh, you know, lack of democracy in response to, the, uh, to its r rule in Korea, its empire. So, so Yoshino, so, so somebody high up in the government calls the editor of the newspaper and says, this guy has to go. And they fire Yoshino. Well, at least they didn't kill him. Well, y yes, it's good that they didn't kill him, but honestly, he becomes impoverished, he loses his influence, and he dies uh, poverty-stricken oh, and, and ill in 1931. So, interesting, because he had so, no platform to advance well, his, his theory. He yeah. had no protection. He had some protection in Tokyo Imperial University. Yeah. He had none there. So, but interesting thing about Yoshino's ideas is Yoshino believed that within... The, what he called the international system of democracy, because he believed the world was going in the direction of democracy. He believed that Jap Japanese democracy would be unique. It would involve their empire, their trade system within their empire, and then, of course, this functional minpon shugi, functional democracy back in Japan. Where, you, where the emperor so, takes care of the people. That's right. So he believed that there was this unique system that Japan was building. Now. His student, uh, Royama Masamichi, now we can bring up a picture of Royama. Um, he's, uh, let's see if, uh, if he shows up here. Um, there he is. So Royama Masamichi is, uh, he's a student of Yoshino. He, become, he comes to mature, he takes a job at Tokyo Imperial University. He becomes this very important guy uh, in, the, in the 1930s because he is a part of of Konoe Fumimaro's informal cabinet, kind of the cabinet of intellectuals. He's the head of that cabinet. Student of Yoshino. Uh, Royama argues, you know what, Yoshino's idea about a Japanese unique sphere, let's take that further. And he argues that Japan is building a unique regional civilization in East Asia. And even more, because of this, Japan, because of the unique nature of the development of modernity in East Asia, with Japan at the head of this empire, do not need to follow international laws. So international laws do not with, apply to the Japanese empire. How does this play with Manchuria? How does it play with the growing imperialism, right. violent imperialism right. that was well, happening in the 30s? Well, so, so Royama's a moderate. And he argues he doesn't like what's happening in Manchuria. He thinks Japan's empire can be peaceable not with military intervention like in Manchuria. 
And so he argues a moderate position on the Manchurian question in 1932. But his ideas fit with increasing Japanese militarism in, in East Asia because Konoe becomes the prime minister of Japan in 1937. He picks up uh, Royama's ideas and said, you know what we're building in East Asia? We're building a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which is essentially a cover for Japanese imperialism and military aggression so in East 30s, Asia. Through the 30s, it was evolving that way. And his, his sense of moderation was losing out. That's and, right. And the war hawks. He quits his job at Tokyo Imperial. Because he's frustrated. Well, he's frustrated and a colleague is fired. So it's a little bit like Charles Beard. <laughs> really? It's yeah, Columbia yeah. That's and right. Tokyo University. And to yeah. So, so Royama is a very important guy. He's this bridge to a Japanese uh, empire, which is very aggressive, but it still is defining itself as a kind of unique version of modernity, its own version of modernity yeah. in East Asia. Yeah, they were, they were, they were ide ideating Western style. Uh, and well, they, were, they, were, they, were, they had accepted the idea of modernity, but they were saying, no, this is not Western modernity. This, this is, is Japan this modernity. Is, this is our own style of modernity, and therefore we do not need to follow international law and follow the rules of international kind of the international system, and indeed they don't. Sounds I mean, like, it sounds like China today. Well, it's, <laughs> this is part of the reason why China can do that because they've, for a long time, they've been building something that's quite a bit different than Western style modernity. So yeah, China today, in many cases, says, well, international laws don't apply to us. It sounds like you're defining the end of the '30s, the end of the intellectual the intellect process that happened in that period. And so um, as the co-host of this show, yes, John, yes. Uh, maybe you should <laughs> state where we are. Give us a, a snapshot right, right. of where we are, say, 1940, right. the end of the 30s, right. and tell us what we're going to cover next okay. time. Okay, so, so one more thing before we do that. Lu Xun, back to China and Lu Xun. So Lu Xun is this intellectual. He's also experiencing a crisis like intellectuals in Japan and, and Charles Beard in the United States. And, and Lu Xun believes that uh, the, the Chinese past is bad, that westernized modernity is, in China is bad. He wants to create a kind of nationalist modernity in China. And there's Lu Xun right there. And uh, he's, he's a very important intellectual. Uh, he's a writer. He writes a short story which would have won the Nobel Peace Prize. It was to be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He refuses. He doesn't want it nominated. Uh, he's a critic of the communists. He's a, in the, commun the Chinese Communist Party. He's a critic of the Guomindong or the nationalists in China. No one escapes his sharp critique. He's a very interesting guy. You, you, you know, in this discussion, you've, you've named a number of people who did that sort of thing, <laughs> yes. including Beard. Yes. You know, they, yes. They, they stand up for what they believe That's in, right. even at great risk. Well, we need more people like that, don't you think? <laughs> no, absolutely. And, you know, these are public intellectuals willing to risk their lives to say, to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. but, but so all of these guys are suffering from this crisis of modernity. The, the, essentially, their faith has been broken. Uh, and so in the 1930s, I think that's what you're seeing. And Lu Xun, um, he dies in 1937. Uh, it would have been interesting to see if he had lived on such a sharp critic, such a a strong international figure for China. Maybe he could have helped shape Chinese communism in a different direction, or maybe Chinese communism never appears. Um, that's, I, that's kind of stretching it a little bit. But at any rate, so you have these intellectuals who are suffering through this major crisis uh, of thought in the 1930s, and modernity really takes it on the chin, so to speak. It's, it's not, it seems like progress is dead with the Great Depression. It seems like human liberation has died with the Holocaust in the West and with Japanese atrocities at Nanking and the rest of East Asia. And it seems like scientific rationality, which was supposed to deliver uh, progress and human liberation, cannot be trusted anymore. So, but the, the war comes and destroys the landscape of East Asia, the people of East Asia, and it really, in some ways, kind of wipes out this crisis as well. So mm -hmm. in the post-war period, 
uh, you, you begin to see uh, new narratives about the strength and the progress of modernity and scientific rationality. So, so it reasserts itself in, in okay, many ways well, after there's, the war. There's something hopeful there. That's right. But where are we leaving this and where are we going next time? That's what we'll talk about next time. We'll talk about the post-war situation and the way that uh, it's both history, the, the way that intellectuals begin to reframe modernity after World War II, uh, but also uh, the way that history began to be written after World War II and in, written in a way that uh, didn't fully kind of square with the facts and allowed us to think that westernization was the only thing that happened in the 20th century East Asia. Thank you, John. You, you're welcome. It's always great. History is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>